Welcome to A Fine Time, The Nanny Revisited. This is a podcast about the nanny, where we recap each episode and then discuss, sharing our own own unique take on each episode. I'm Bernadette. And I'm Debbie. Today we're talking about episode 81, Me and Mrs. Joan. As usual, we'll start with a brief summary of the episode. In an attempt to avoid his estranged father, Maxwell insists that Fran kiss him. While she readily obliged, James Sheffield sees Maxwell anyway. Fran refuses to perpetuate the feud between father and son and invites James to dinner at the Sheffield home. At dinner, Joan reveals that she hasn't only been James's secretary this whole time, but rather he made an honest woman out of her and married her. Fran is shocked that another Sheffield would marry someone out of his class and then takes pointers from Joan about trying to convince Maxwell to come around and follow his father's example. In short, Fran comes into his office in tight pants and a crop top and is delighted when Maxwell seems to be rethinking his hatred for his father, seemingly concluding that there's no reason to break the tradition of Sheffield's marrying their employees. That train of thought and Fran and Maxwell's makeout session are cut short by James being confronted by Sylvia, who lost the fine's entire life savings of $25,000 on an investment tip James gave her. Maxwell recants his decision because he's reminded how much pain his father's selfish, hedonistic lifestyle causes other people. In the end, Fran rejects Maxwell's offer to repay her parents for the money they lost, and she pretends to see James again just to get Maxwell to kiss her again. Meanwhile, Brighton has become a ballerina in an attempt to meet girls, and it does not go as he anticipated. Bernadette, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, No, I don't believe so. All right, would you like to take us to scene one? Yeah, so we open um, this time outdoors, and it's Fran and Maxwell, and they're in front of a display. We later learn it's a gallery, and Maxwell is pointing to the painting that's kind of pointing out to the street, and he's like, Miss Fine, look how voluptuous and fleshy this nude is. Obviously, the artist was inspired by Rubens, to which Fran says, yeah, well, if you ask me, she had one too many Rubens herself. I'm I know sure how you, you feel about uh, that. Yeah, I'm sure you know <laughs> what I'm going to say about that. <laughs> anyway, and and um, Maxwell's like, oh, no, you must find, like, back then, being full-figured was the standard of beauty. And again, Fern continues, meanwhile, today, you'd see her sitting around the piano bar singing show tunes with her three gay friends. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> not a fan of this exchange. But anyway, at, it's at this point that... Um, Maxwell spots his father in the gallery and he um and but he just first says you know like that's my father and Fran doesn't realize he's actually pointing to his father and she starts talking about how her uncle Lewis started to develop breasts around 60 and and Maxwell's like no like that's my actual father and he starts saying I've got a few words to say to that cold manipulative son of a oh my god he's coming out let's go let's go and Fran kind of pulls him back because you know he was grabbing onto her trying to pull her away and she's like no I will not be a part of this you know perpetuating of this feud between you and your father and Maxwell's just desperate goes just kiss me and she's like okay Right. So they start kissing. Right. She didn't need any convincing. No, not at all. She's like, (laughs) okay. And then, of course, his father comes out of the gallery, spots them kissing, and he's like, Maxwell, what a surprise. And, um, and again, I think, uh, is it Fran who makes a comment about like also doing that tomorrow or something? Yeah, but before that, Max was like, "Father, oh, oh, good lord, gracious me, Miss Fine, would you believe it? My my father was inside the gallery that we were kissing in front of, and she's like, oh, <laughs> what a coincidence. Where are you going to be tomorrow? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then again, like Maxwell's father is like very confident in a way. I don't know. He he just, you know, comes in and he introduces himself as James Sheffield. Um, I'd say he's even kind of flirty. like Yeah, well, and he said, you know, I'm Maxwell's father, James Sheffield. And Fran's like, oh, I'm Fran, fine, I'm Maxwell's. And she uses Maxwell's, not Mr. Sheffield's. And then she kind of pauses and she's like, well, it depends on what day it is. Correct. Um, 
And then Maxwell's father is trying to prompt Maxwell into giving him a hug. And this is when the snarky exchange starts to take place. Mm -hmm. I do not have everything verbatim. I do. I do have like a summary though. So if you want it verbatim, go for it. But sure. Um, Maxwell resists his father asking him for a hug. He's like, why don't you get enough hugs from that secretary you've been in your family for? Draw up. And like he drops his voice and Fran's like, wait, what I do? And yeah, it is kind of like he kind of um, moves his body kind of towards her. Right. It's you like, know, like it's kind of direct. Like she interprets it as directed to her when it's not. He's just like adding it in at the end, trollop kind of. Yeah. So to me, it was like he's saying it to her. Like he's directing the comment to her, but it's not about her. Yeah. Well, it kind of seemed somewhat passive aggressive, but more aggressive than passive aggressive stuff. Like, he's slipping it in at the end. Quieter, but still loud enough to be heard, but not saying it directly to his father. Correct. And so, yeah. Yeah, and but then, like, it doesn't end there because, you know, so Fran's like, what I do? And James is mm -hmm. like, well, Maxwell, I, I never set out to hurt your mother. She's a lovely woman. And then he does the same thing by adding, true. And, and Fran's like, look, I'll take it from true. him. True. Right, true. And Fran's like, yeah. look, I'll take it from him, but but you, I just met. Mm -hmm. Like, because again, she interprets it as if she's being called a shrew. Exactly. And so Maxwell, though, again, is clearly like not enjoying being around his father, and he wants to get out. He's like, "Oh well, this is wonderful. You know, let's do this again in like ten years." Mm -hmm. And um, you know, he he walks. He starts to walk away, and his father's like again, upset that Maxwell's just trying to walk away, and he yells after him. So France doesn't go with him. Like, she's still on the sidewalk next to the father. And the mm -hmm. father's yelling after, you know, Maxwell, oh, why don't you, you know, are you just going to put a dagger in your father's heart? I could be dead in a year. And she turns to him, and she goes, oh, my God, you're Jewish. Mm-hmm. And that is the opening scene. Do you have anything else you'd like to add to it? The only thing I want to say is my comment before about how flirty James is. You know, when he comes out um, and he, he go, James comes out and talks to Fran and Maxwell, he says to Maxwell, who is this gorgeous woman and what is she doing kissing you and not me? Uh, yes, yes, that's true. So that's all I wanted to add. All right, so... Um, now in scene two, we're in the Sheffield home and um, Brighton is talking to Fran, uh, sorry, they're in the kitchen and Brighton is talking about how he wants to take ballet lessons. What's wrong with a 15 year old guy wanting to take ballet lessons? And Fran's like, nothing, sweetheart. It isn't you, is it? And he's like, yeah, it's me. And Maggie's there and she comments, you already look like a boiled chicken in a tank top. Now you want to wear tights? And Fran's like, oh, stop it. Look how mature your sister's being, pointing to Gracie. And Gracie chimes in. He goes to a different school. No one knows we're related. She doesn't care what he does. Um, and, you know, Fran basically tells him, you know, leave your brother alone. He just wants to express himself artistically. The girls walk away, and she says to Brighton, you're looking to meet chicks. And he's like, yeah. And so Fran says to Niles that, you know, I think I think it's time that I marched myself into Mr. Sheffield's office and tell him that his son wants to be a ballerina. And I was like, okay, what horrible thing have you done that won't seem so bad after you tell him this? Brian's like, oh, I invited his father to the house for dinner. And now it's like, and you're going to tell him now, ooh, just let me get to the intercom. He pulls over like a stool and put, puts it down. He's like, talk to me, baby. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're setting excited. up. He's very excited. We're setting up the, the major events. Do you uh, want to add anything, or would you like to take us into, I believe, the living room? I will take us to the living room, where Cece and Niles are there, and Cece is positively giddy. She's saying to Niles, I can't believe she invited his father to dinner. What did he say? And, like, Niles kind of gives her a look, and she's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And she, like, takes out money and hands it to him. And Niles is like, he was livid. You know, he said it this time, she's taken it too far and threatened to, and then he stops. And of course, Cece's like, what, what, fire her? And 
Niall still doesn't say anything. So she's like, okay. And she pulls out more money and hands it to him. And he goes, fire her. Mm-hmm. And then um, at this point, Fran and Maxwell come in. And they're obviously in the middle of an argument. And um, Maxwell, I think, is like trying to escape the house. And he's saying to Fran, are you trying to kill me? You're not in the will, in my will, by the way, you know, because she he's still like, why did you invite him to dinner? Mm-hmm. And Fran, meanwhile, is like, oh, you can't leave. Like, if you do, you know, my mom, my mother's coming over. If you leave, she'll think that we have problems. Again, they're acting like an old married couple. Mm-hmm. And Maxwell's like, we are. You're about to be found floating in the river, and I'm about to be pulled in for questioning. Exactly. And, we kind of pan over to where Cece and Niles are by the door, and Cece is just like, oh, this is fabulous. Like, she's loving it. And apparently, Niles has been taping it, because he pulls out of the, re- like, the recording thing. He's like, relive the magic um, at home, 1995. And Cece hands him presumably a 20 or, you know, some amount of money and takes the the uh, recording yeah the tape and and she's still like so happy about this turn of events she's like there's so much going on i i would love to stay for dinner but at this time she's already kind of over the threshold and niles is like but you're not invited and closes the door in her face Mm -hmm. um and then they were, were kind of panning back um to Fran and Maxwell, and they're talking about something about, um, there's a comment made about how uh, at, when they go out to eat, like yeah, Fran's so, family, they yeah, fight so over. Maxwell mm-hmm. starts by saying, you have no idea what you've gotten yourself into. The last time my father and I dined together, it almost came to blows. And she's and like, that, oh, you should see my family. Yeah, because when they go over, they fight over um like the pork or whatever and Niles is like Miss Pork Miss Fine and she's like oh it doesn't count if it's Chinese food. Yeah she does Which, say that. Yeah. And so um you know Fran's still trying to like find common ground. You know, you must have a lot in common and stuff like that. And Max was like, well, I am you know didn't abandon my responsibilities for sexual gratification, you know, with some cheap floozy. Who works and I for think, me. Yeah, like, who works for me. And Frank goes, oh, why? Mm-hmm. And um, at that time, doorbell rings, Niles opens it. It's James Sheffield. And, you know, he's he says to Niles, oh, you look great. You don't look a day over 90. And Niles is like, that's, you know, you're thinking of my father or something. And, and James is like, oh, well, if that's the case, then you look like hell. Mm-hmm. Which is not nice. Not nice. Um, and anyway, so James is there and, um, it, you know, he's saying to Maxwell, you know, it takes a big man, you know, because he's thinking this is coming from Axel, you know, setting this dinner up to apologize or like mend their bridges and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And Maxwell is like, no, actually, it takes a woman with big hair. Correct. To kind of set this up. And Fran again is trying to mend this relationship. And he's like, she's like, you know, like, she, so he went, you know, 25 years ago with a woman, you know, you're always going to be her son, or sorry, his son, but what about her? And then, of course, this is when Joan (laughs) comes in. Here I am, darling. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, she's still around, the secretary that James abandoned his family for. And what we find is that She's wearing the same dress as Fran. So, of course, Correct. they to each other are like, oh, to die for. And, um, you know, I, 
is it who says stunning and so tasteful? Brand. You know, to to Joan because obviously it's kind of a self compliment <laughs> as well, since they're wearing the same outfit. Um, and meanwhile, Joan is trying to kind of like talk to Maxwell, you know, about how, um, you know, when he was younger, he loved to play hide and seek. You know, he loved to hide under my skirt. Or was that your father? Mm -hmm. And then meanwhile, um, still reminiscing about like the old days, you know, there used to be that chubby little chap who, you know, followed you around or, you know, took care of you. And of course, Niles kind of walks behind and says, hey, it was an awkward stage. Mm -hmm. And then uh, door blowing, oh, you know, I don't know. If I they, think the oh, bell rings. Whatever. Yeah, okay. And in comes Sylvia and Yetta. And so Max was like, ah, Naomi and Wainona are here. Correct. And so everybody who is going to be at the party has now arrived. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add? Do you think this is one of those times we should talk about what Fran and uh, Joan are wearing? Sure. Or, or should we wait until favorite fashion? It. I mean, I think the main point is they're wearing the same dress. But if you want to talk more about it, that's fine. Um, I can wait. Um, okay. All right. So I'll take us to dinner then. Yes. Um, as we can all imagine, this dinner party um, does not go off without a hitch. Um, so the first issue we come across is that uh, someone has spilled Dijon mustard on James's tie. And so Sylvia, who's sitting next to him, is trying to help him out and, like, get rid of the stain. She's like, oh, don't worry, it comes right out. But it turns out it doesn't. The stain apparently looks just like Jill uh, Eikenberry. And, um, Jill Eikenberry, yeah. Yeah. And um, Yetta chimes in, oh, don't worry, I spill a lot, too. This used to be a solid. And she's wearing a multicolored sequin jacket, which clearly had never been a solid in its life. Exactly. Um, well, so Joan chimes in, well, don't worry, darling, to, to James, you know, trying to console him about the ruined tie. And um, she explains to the group that I prefer it if James doesn't wear a tie at all. It just takes me longer to undress him. And James is a little embarrassed. Oh, don't tell secrets out of the bedroom. And she's like, what bedroom? I'm talking about last night in the elevator of the equity building. Whew, I could tell you stories about this one. And Fran's like, oh, I, I could tell you stories about this one. Going to get Maxwell. Sure, I made him up, but boy, they knocked your socks off. Um, mm -hmm. And Maxwell has just this look on his face like, boy. Um, and Sylvia says to James that it's funny how you ended up with someone from the other side of the river, like father, like son. Fran's like, ma. And Joan's like, you know, it's not an insult. I'm proud of the fact that my father worked on the tube for 30 years. And Fran's like, oh, my father sat in front of the tube for 40. Mm -hmm. And so that's another similarity. And it continues. J uh, Joan says, do you know, before I, I worked for James, I almost got a job at Buckingham Palace doing the Queen's hair. And Fran's like, I almost got a job in the village doing hair on Queen's. And mm -hmm. James is like, well, Maxwell, it's obvious that we're attracted to the same kind of woman. You've inherited my gift for mixing business with pleasure. And Maxwell has to reject this out of hand. I'm sorry to disappoint you, father, but I hired Miss Fine solely on her extensive experience in child care. And Fran's like, that's right. Grabs his wine glass from him and hands it to Niles. You had enough. Niles, take it away. Yep. Um, so if dinner isn't awkward enough, it continues. Um, Sylvia asks James about, um, you know, basically, she says to him, you've obviously done very well for yourself. I mean, this isn't the cheap tie, although now it's not worth anything. And he's like, oh, I do all right. I make most of my money in investments. In fact, I got a hot tip guaranteed to triple your return. No commitment short term. And Max is like, no commitment short term. Hmm. Throw in some children and a dumped wife and you got your life. Um, and Joan's like, isn't this delightful? And she's like trying to change the subject. Where did you get the exquisite shrimp? And yet it chimes in. I came with her. Going to get Sylvia. And Joan's like, no, dear, I meant the crustacean. And yet it's like, oh, she's my daughter. Yeah. And clearly Joan's attempt did not work. She's like, oh, jolly good. Um, well, where were we? Ah, yes, Maxwell was calling me a tramp. Um, and Maxwell's like, no offense, Joan, but father, I cannot imagine what possessed you to bring this woman into my home. My poor mother sitting alone like a dog. 
And Fran's like, I thought you hated your mother. And he's like, well, I like her now. Well, Geta, uh, I'm not quite sure if it was an attempt to change the subject or if she's just in her own little world. Has anyone seen Babe? How did mm-hmm. you have Pig to learn all those lines? Mm-hmm. Everyone ignores her. And Fran says to Maxwell, why don't you just cut your father some slack? I mean, he obviously just wants to live his life hassle-free without any commitments, not unlike you. Let it go, she says to herself. The man's entitled to a girlfriend. And Joan responds, not if his wife has anything to say about it. And she holds up a hand. Fran's like, you are married? Isn't that delightful? She says, slapping Maxwell's shoulder. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, says James, we were playing cat and mouse so long, I decided to make an honest woman out of her. Fran's like, well... I was wrong. You and your father are completely different, and I like him better. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, James asks, well, Maxwell, how about a toast to me and my new wife? Maxwell's like, wife? I think gold digger is a more appropriate description. How dare you speak to your mother like that, says James. And Maxwell's walked up, basically huffed out of the room. James follows him. Joan gets up, stepmother, darling, youthful stepmother. And like mm-hmm. they've left, and so now it's just like the fines in the room. And Sylvia's like, "Do you think after all this, anyone would be in the mood for their little red potatoes?" And then Yetta has an epiphany. What am I nuts? A pig can't learn lines. He must have used cue cards. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want to add anything to that um, train wreck of a dinner? No. Nope. You got it covered. <laughs> All right, would you uh, like to take us um, to the next scene? Yes. So, Niles is filling in Cece about what happened at the dinner. I believe they're in the living room. And I he's believe like, so. and, then, and then Mr. Sheffield, like, was it called her a tramp or something? Accused her of being a gold digger. Oh, accused her of being a gold digger. And... Cece's like, which one? And Niles does that like thing where obviously he's waiting for some type of payment. So Cece takes off the necklace she is wearing and hands it to him. And now Niles just says, the young one. Um, but they get interrupted. And so Niles is like, okay, meet me later in the kitchen and bring in alligator Gucci's size nine and a half D. Yep. Um, so let me see. so we have like Fran, I believe. Um, and she's you know still upset over what happened at the dinner. Like, why did she do this? And you know, she's in English and all that. And Niles is like, is it because like you find out found out that there, you know, is a Sheffield willing to marry <laughs> the employee? And she's like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then Brighton comes in and he's upset. Like, I mean, not upset, upset, but he's basically like trying to get out of ballet now because there's a lot of muscular, good looking guys in there who are obviously looking for chicks. And Frank have does a side comment of not necessarily. And it turns out that like it, Brighton's the lightest mm-hmm. in the class, so he's already been made head swan. Um, so he like he can't just like up and quit, right? Um, and Fran's like, "Are you worried about being labeled?" Um, you know, there are plenty of like manly, you know, ballet performers out there. She and she's like Barishkakov, and then she can't think of anybody else. Exactly. And then she's like. Well, okay, maybe, you know, like, if you tell your father, like, he'll pull you out, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, And so Brian's like, oh, okay, you know, like, he's into that idea. So he starts going upstairs, but he does it in a way where clearly he's taking, like, incorporating some ballet footwork, right? Correct. And so Brian makes kind of a comment, and not a moment too soon. Mm -hmm. And then we have Joan at the door, and this time they're not wearing the exact same outfit, but they are both wearing, like, the same shade of red, right? Right. I mean, honestly, I think every time we see them, 
except the last scene together. I'm not sure it's the exact same outfit, but it's like the same outfit with a slight variation. Like yeah. Fran is the younger version and Joan is a slightly older, slightly wealthier mm-hmm. version. Yes. So they are both in red outfits. And of course, oh, they both both say to each other, love the outfit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Joan has come over because, you know, she's trying to say like, James, you know, pretends he doesn't care, but he actually does. And um, it, so they're, they're both kind of commiserating to some extent. Um, and he, yeah, so, they talk about how, like, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, you know, Joan is explaining that James pretends not to care how Maxwell thinks, but it's one of the things that keeps him up at night. I'm the other. And yes. then, which, anyway, um, she's talking, yeah. about, so, like, they start sort of comparing notes, if you will. Yep. And part of that is that Joan talks about, you know, uh, she was hoping Maxwell wouldn't be so judgmental and narrow-minded like mm-hmm. his family is. Um because she she says, and at this time, both she and Fran are, have walked kind of closer to where the couches are. And she's like, can you believe they thought that I wasn't of the same class? And of course, this is the time she starts picking at her like teeth, like Fran mm-hmm. often does. And so, of course, Fran also um, starts picking at her teeth. And she's like, oh, that's such bull. Mm-hmm. And they like sit down together. And then Joan's kind of giving... Fran a bit more of a background, you know, on her relationship, it took James 10 years to make a move on her. And, you know, she remembers it. One day she went into his office to change the ribbon in his typewriter. And she was wearing, um, how did she describe it? Debbie, do you have it? A sexy little Mm. midriff top and a very, very short mini skirt. Yep. And for this, Fran's like, oh, oh, I couldn't wear something like that. You know, like, I have to take care of kids or children, mm-hmm. which, of course, is, like, <laughs> not accurate. Which gets a huge laugh from the audience. Yes. And and she, t- you know, talks about, like, that was when he, like, told her, her um, he told her she loved him. And then Fran's like, and then he took it back. And Joan's like, no, he proved it six times and it's like I hate my life uh-huh. and so then J- uh, Joan decides to go into like more detail so first he dimmed the lights and then he brought my body close and he swept off you know his desk oh do you have any ice because Joan has a, a drink and we see Fran has been listening intently to Joan describing the scene and has like in the little um, tongs, like a piece of ice, like an ice cube that she's like rubbing up and down her throat. Uh Uh-huh. As she's like listening as if to cool her down. And and so she's like, oh, 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 here. And like puts that ice cube Uh in Joan's drink. And I'm like, oh. Exactly. And and Joan's is talking about... um, and, you know, that was the first night I libbled, uh, nibbled on James's ear. He loved it. I also did. And this is at the point Joan leans in and whispers something to Fran. And Fran pulls back and says, oh, I can't do that. I'm Jewish. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the scene. Do you have anything you'd like to add? I do not. Okay. Well, you take us to the office. I would love to. So... Fran comes into the office, Maxwell's sitting at the desk, and Fran comes into the office, and here we need to talk about what she's wearing. She is wearing a short black shirt that comes just below her, like, breast line, and then tight, um, tight patterned pants, and she says, oh, Mr. Sheffield, it's time to change your ribbon, and she's holding a little box of typewriter ribbon. Where's your typewriter? And he looks up and says, it's in the attic with my Peter Max posters. And Fran's like, oh, see ya. And starts rolling her shirt down. And he's like, oh, Miss Fine, wait. And she turns around. Yes, rolls the shirt back up. And he said, I've had an epiphany. And she's like, already? Just from doing this? And she gestures to her, to her outfit. 
And he explains that he's always resented his father for his total lack of concern for anyone's feelings but his own. He's always lived solely for his own pleasure. Maybe that ain't so bad, huh? I mean, maybe he's got the right idea. I mean, I'm a man. I have needs too, right? And for and like he and Fran are like getting closer to each other, and she's like, "Oh, good, because because I I can use a couple multiple epiphanies myself." Mm-hmm. And like they're staring at each other, um, and I think that's when Brighton comes in, and he's like, "I've got a problem," and Fran's like, "Go solve it yourself, honey." It, it builds character. And he's like, no, okay, dad, here it is. I'm in a ballet class and I don't care what you say. I love it and I'm staying in. And Max was like, well, son, you should do whatever makes you happy. And Brighton's like, even if you call the school and demand they take me out of that class, I'm not leaving. And Max was like, I want you to do it. And Brighton's like, would mm-hmm. you let me live my own life for the love of God? I'm a ballerina. And like, he mm-hmm. huffs it and marches himself out. And Fran's like, oh, I'll tell you. He's lucky to have people who uh, love and support him. And she's like, going to close the door. Oh, come here. Look how baggy his butt looks in those tights. And Max will look and they both laugh. She closes the door. So you are saying you're a man. You've got needs. And he's like, well, maybe I should just face the fact that my father fell in love with his secretary. And Fran has, and your sister fell in love with her chauffeur. And he has, and my father married, my grandfather married his maid. Fran's like, no sense breaking tradition. Max was like, none that I can see. And then they kiss. Mm-hmm. And Brent pulls away. Wait, something missing. And he's like, what? She's like, oh, I know. And she takes her arms and she she sweeps everything off his desk. And then they kiss again. And like, this is a much more heated, um, primal, if you will, kiss. Mm-hmm. He like leans her back on the desk and he, he like climbs on top of her. And, of mm-hmm. course, they're interrupted by Niles knocking on the door. And mm-hmm. Max is like, what are you doing here? And he's like, I'm picturing myself in Miss Babcock's BMW. Mm-hmm. Well, in come uh, James and Joan. And J- they're, they're off to wherever they're going. And Joan's like, oh, we just came to say goodbye. Oh, honey, you've got a post-it on your bum. And well, so she does. Fran takes it off and crumples it. And Maxwell says, so father, I'm, I'm glad you stopped by. I, I think I owe you an apology. And Fran's like, oh, you don't want to keep them waiting. I mean, if there's a time difference where you're going, you're probably late already. And Maxwell's like, no, no, just a minute, Miss Fine. I have something I need to say to my father. And Fran's like, well, alrighty then. And he's like, father, I believe I was wrong about you. And Fran's like, that was beautiful. Enjoy your trip. Like, she's just trying to get them out the door. Well, yeah. unfortunately, she didn't move quickly enough because in comes Sylvia. We're wiped out. We lost $25,000 on that investment of yours. And James is like, well, you win some, you lose some. Thank God that's all you invested. Well, that's not how Sylvia feels because that was their life savings. Mm-hmm. And, and James can't believe that was their entire life savings. And Sylvia points out to him, you said it was guaranteed triple our money. And Fran's like, oh, mom, nobody forced you. You can't point fingers. And then Sylvia points out that was the money we were going to move to Boca with. Fran grabs James by his his shirt, I guess, like near his throat. You're a dead man. Mm-hmm. And and Max was like, Father, how can you be so cavalier? These people are living on a fixed income. And Sylvia's like, I feel faint. I need something. And Niles like, I'll get you some water. And she's like, No steak. I need protein. And Maxwell says to his father that you're so incredibly insensitive. And James is like, How can you say I'm insensitive when you're the one who's making me late for cocktails? Well, uh-huh. this this was the end for, for Maxwell. What was I thinking? I was actually trying to be more like you. Now I remember how much pain your selfishness causes other people. I'm sorry, Miss Fine. I'm sorry for what almost happened here. Well, that's all bloody over with now. And Fran's like, all righty then. She opens the Godiva's, throws the lid, and starts chowing down. Uh-huh. And James says, well, I hope you realize our Christmas get-together at my chalet in Tuscany is off. And Max was like, you'd think I'd actually want to spend my holidays in the Italian countryside, gorging on rich food, partying with European glitterati? Well, I wouldn't. And I wouldn't dream of subjecting my family to it either. And Fran does that very annoying, why? Wine again. And anyway, so James is ready to leave, tells Joan to come with him. And she says, just a minute, darling. And then she says to Fran, I know what you're thinking, but there's a part of James that is good. Not as good as it was 20 years ago, but it does the job. Oh, and by the way, darling, I think the junior may still come around, but I'd lay off the chocolates if I were you. And she taps Fran's 
bottom and Fran spits out her chocolate and that's mm-hmm. the scene yep do you want to add anything no you covered it all right would you like to take us uh to the next scene yes so we are back kind of in front of the gallery the um Maxwell and Fran are outside and I think believe they're sitting mm-hmm. at first and kind of ch- you know chatting and um, Maxwell is just saying how he feels so awful, you know, that her parents lost their money and, and Fran's like, you feel awful, you know, like what? And he's just like, I feel like I should like try to make it up to them in some way. And Fran's like, oh, you know, like grandchildren, mm-hmm. <laughs> that would be one way to make it up for them. But then Maxwell says, you know, that he was thinking about maybe reimbursing them their money and Fran shoots that down. It's like, no, 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 they're way too prideful. Uh, they'll never take it or whatever, but you know, they'll talk about it constantly, bring it up for years, all that kind of stuff. But then she kind of looks over, um, I think, do they get up or something? Yeah, or they, they get up still and they're, they get up and they're um, right in front of the gallery again. Uh, yeah, and Fran goes, <gasps> it's your father in the gallery coming out. And so, of course, they kiss again. But Mm -hmm. the gentleman who walks out of the gallery is like an older African-American man. Mm -hmm. And and so, of course, when Maxwell sees him, he's like, that's not my father. And Fran's like, oh, my mistake. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was clearly a ploy on her end to... uh, get him to kiss her correct and that's the episode do you have anything to add i do not okay so before we get into shticks i kind of wanted to ask you like what your thoughts were on the whole ballet subplot it sort of felt unnecessary um in that like i I, it sort of felt like the only reason they had that was so we saw the kids for a few minutes yeah, well, I feel like the only reason that, but also, like, to have at that end scene to Maxwell subvert expectations of Brighton, because um, Brighton was hoping he, Maxwell would get him out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just didn't care for it with how they were talking about it and, like, making fun of it and, like, all that kind of stuff. Fair. I will also point out that it, it's sort of inconsistent with the characters, at least Maxwell, as we've known him thus far. I mean, if, just think back to seasons two and three, when um, actually, I think even going back to the first season, I mean, Maxwell's been very interested in getting Brighton involved in sports, getting him to do something manly. And like, mm-hmm. so Brighton going and doing ballet and Maxwell being fine with it is just sort of out of character. I mean, I suppose the argument is it shows character growth on Maxwell's part, but... Well, I feel like place. they had him do that because he was trying to be more like his father. Oh, interesting. In that moment. Of just, like, do whatever you want. <laughs> but, I don't I, know. I, I, didn't, I didn't take it as that. I took it as, like, legitimate character growth that, you know, his son is a different person. He's going to be supportive, kind of like in Canasta Masta where Niles has to basically convince Maxwell to support Brighton in his, you know, desire to play Canasta on Yetta's team. And, like, mm-hmm. reminds him, like, your father didn't, and your your father was supportive of you uh, doing musical theater, right? And he's like, no, don't you remember? He didn't come to my first show, Sound of Music. I saved that when I was just 17. Oh, shut up, Niles. Like, um, mm-hmm. I don't know. It, it just, it just, sort of felt out of character and actually I, I'd say that's a broader point on this episode for for me that there are just things that like I'm not gonna say totally out of character but like they sort of ignored for most of the episode like other things we've established about the Sheffield family mm-hmm. like you know um Joan makes a comment about how she was hoping that Maxwell wouldn't be as you know um judgmental as the rest of his family and like it sort of seems that's a, a silly thing to say because a his sister married her chauffeur b his mm-hmm. brother runs a nightclub mm-hmm. like they don't seem super judgmental to me um mm-hmm. 
the mother most definitely is judgmental as we will recall from the two Mrs. Sheffields in season three. Um, Mm -hmm. But like, it just, I don't know. It just seemed like it, it disregarded other things about the family. So. Yep. Yeah. The other thing I thought was very odd was just Mm -hmm. like consistently throughout this particular episode, there's just this continuous talk about weight. Just we start out with the painting. There's that comment aimed towards Niles and towards the middle of the episode about that little chubby fellow. You know, yeah, chap. Fellow. And then we end, you know, like at the end, the last thing Joan kind of says is that Fran needs to lay off the chocolates. It was mm-hmm. just a bit more like prominent in this episode, I feel like. It was a little bit prominent, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So did you have anything else you kind of wanted to address before we got into shticks? No, I'm fine. We can jump into our favorite fashion. Okay. So as mentioned, the first outfit that Joan and um, Fran wear, it's the same dress. They wear it. They have different, like, under things with it, though. Like, I think, like... So it's a zebra dress, right? Yeah, zebra print. Yeah, sorry, zebra print dress. And I believe Fran has like a a black top underneath it. I think Fran's wearing her usual black turtleneck. Yeah, like it's it's her like staple kind of look, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas Joan has kind of like a sheer. Yes. Kind of thing underneath. and so while Fran is, as we said, in a turtleneck, Joan's uh, chest is bare, but she has like the sheer long sleeves. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then again, when they both show up later, they're both in red kind of suits, mm-hmm. but different kind of um, details to it. Right. I believe Fran has like. Does she have the white kind of collar, or is that Joan? Uh, Fran has a black collar. Sorry, black collar. Yeah, and, and then, like, Joan has, like, some buttons or something, maybe? Yeah, Joan has, like, gold buttons down the front and on on the, the pockets, I think. Um, mm-hmm. Joan also has a belt around her midsection. Um, they're both wearing dark tights. And I think they're both wearing um, boots as well. Mm -hmm. so so yeah so not exactly the same but again similar enough that you can tell this is another instance in which they're trying to draw comparisons between the two correct yeah it you have like a favorite outfit this episode not really um Mm -hmm. i I, I guess if I had to pick one, it would probably be what Fran's wearing in, in the kitchen when Brighton's talking about trying to uh, do ballet. She's wearing, I think, a black skirt, I think, and then like a multicolored button-down blouse that has like all these little um, squares of different colors. But like mm-hmm. not not super enamored with it either. How about you? Yeah, I, d- I don't think I really had a favorite outfit in this episode um well let me ask you um for the the two times that we see fran and joan and basically analogs of each other whose do you prefer whose outfit did you prefer hmm that's hard uh deep sigh for yes the, for the red outfit Part of it, too, I think, would be on what occasion you're wearing the outfits. I suppose that's uh, fair. I don't know. Did you have, like, a strong preference for one over the other? Um, I c- actually kind of like Jones better in the um, the zebra print. Mm-hmm. I, I, I kind of liked the sheer arms, and I think I preferred the v-neck as an actual v-neck instead of over the turtleneck. Um, mm-hmm. Also, I mean, she was also wearing the jewelry to match. Um, not, not that it was zebra print, but like it was big and flashy and Fran 
Fran didn't have that. Fran instead had the like zebra print headband in her hair. Um, mm -hmm. As for the the red suits, I, I think I'm going to go with Fran's because it to me it just feels a little bit younger. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's fair. I think the like the buttons and stuff made Jones seem a bit older. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. Did you have any other fashion you wanted to discuss? I did not. Did you? I did not. All right. Would you like to take us to some notable New Yorkers? Okay. So the episode title is Me and Mrs. Joan. We haven't said yet who plays Joan. We have not. It is Joan Collins. Correct. We've talked about her before. She's an English actress, columnist, and author who's been recognized for her philanthropy. And in my book, best known for her role as Joan Sheffield on Nanny. <laughs> Yep. Um, so then in the very first scene, you know, Maxwell talks about Rubens, not the sandwich. Correct. Rubens was an influential Flemish artist known for the Flemish Baroque tradition. And that's according to our friends at Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then... Um, Do you want to talk about Rubens' sandwich? <laughs> Do you want to talk? Go ahead. If you want to talk about I, I didn't. I, I looked up what a Ruben sandwich was. Um, it's a corned beef sandwich on rye bread with Swiss cheese and sauerkraut covered in dressing. That's according to our friends at allrecipes.com. They actually had a note that a Ruben sandwich would be found in a, a Jewish style deli, but they're not kosher because they mix meat and dairy. So. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. Huh. Okay. Um, yeah, so Naomi and Winona. The Judds, uh, an American mother-daughter country duo. That's according to our friends at Wikipedia. And apparently, apparently that's Yetta and Sylvia in Maxwell's eyes. Correct. Um, okay, was the Jill Finkenberg a person or just like a fictional? Jill Eikenberry was an American actor. Uh, it, I think she is an American actress best known for her role on L.A. Law. That's according to our friends at Wikipedia. She was playing that role at the time that this episode aired, I believe. Ah, okay. Or Did you... very shortly before that. I, I can't recall exactly when this one aired. Mm -hmm. so. Did you look at the equity building or no? I did. And I think it's actually the equitable building, not the equity okay. building, because there okay. is a skyscraper on Broadway in Lower Manhattan's financial district known as the Equitable Building. And that's mm -hmm. according to our friends at Wikipedia. Again, uh, Joan makes reference to Buckingham Palace. The, and I'm going to quote, the official London residence of the UK's sovereign since 1837 and today is the administrative headquarters of the monarch, end quote. According to uh, our friends at um, royal.uk slash royal re residences Buckingham Palace, it, do you want to guess how many rooms it has? 500. You were <laughs> short. 775 rooms, including wow. 52 guest and royal bedrooms, 188 staff bedrooms, 78, uh, sorry, bedrooms and bedrooms, 78 bathrooms and 19 state rooms. Wow. Exactly. That's why I, I felt like I needed to include that detail. Mm -hmm. Now we have yet another reference to Babe. <laughs> We do, and because we've talked about it previously, I did not look it up. For those who have not listened to our previous podcast, Babe is a, a movie about a talking pig. Yes. Which was obvious um, from Yetta's commentary about it. Yes, yes. Although I doubt they had cute cards. <laughs> uh, if they did, that's one smart pig. Yep. Um, I don't know if you made anything about the alligator Gucci's that Niles requests for CC to bring or not. Oh, I didn't. Um, I didn't think of that. Yeah. I mean, Gucci, again, is just a very well-known um, fashion. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, Baryshnikov. A Russian-American actor, choreographer, and dancer who is known as the preeminent male dancer of the 1970s and 80s. And that's according to our friends at Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, I don't, I, did you have any more? Uh, just a few. Okay. Um, Peter Max, he was a German-American oh, yeah. artist who was known for his use of bright colors and whose art 
is associated with the 1960s. That's according okay. to our friends at Wikipedia. Uh, BMW, we've talked about previously. Um, you already talked about Joan Collins. And then finally, the last one I have is Robert Vaughn, who played James Sheffield. He's ah. an American actor who's uh, to other people known for roles in the Young Philadelphians, the Delta Force, and others. To me, he will always be known as James Sheffield. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <The> end. <laughs> nice. So, Yudisha Cop. <laughs> so, we, we only have a couple here. Um, first off, pork is not kosher, whether it's in Chinese food or not. Uh, mm -hmm. Pork is treif. Uh, shrimp is also treif, uh, as are other crustaceans. We, we don't eat sea creatures that aren't, um, that don't have skins and scales and fins. Skins is what happens when you try to say scales and fins at the same time. <laughs> um, pork, uh, the reason pork is not kosher is because uh, pigs are land animals and they do not have split hooves and chew their cud. Um, and then the, I think probably the most interesting is after Joan leans in and whispers to in Fran's ear what she did to James, and Fran says, I can't do that, I'm Jewish. I'm assuming she's talking about oral sex, mm. uh, which traditionally is considered forbidden because of the concern about spilling of seed unnecessarily or improperly. Um, more, more, modern, um, more modern rabbinic views is that within a marriage, uh, a man can do anything he wants with his wife as long as he has her consent. So mm -hmm. more modern rabbis would say that that's fine, but traditionally speaking, that would be forbidden. Mm -hmm. So, did I miss anything? I don't think so. Excellent. All right, some 90s nostalgia? Yes, so that tape that uh, Niles records. Correct. Like, relive it for 1995. I think like 1995 is like the classic amount you'd see on infomercials too. <laughs> Right. Or the Home Shopping Network or something. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this can be yours for nineteen ninety-five plus shipping and handling. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh How about you? the discussion of a typewriter and a typewriter ribbon. Uh-huh. Even even in the nineties that was dated. Yeah. <laughs> Although like I remember um was it called like an electric typewriter? That we had that I would occasionally play on. Um, um, in school, we had in school we had uh, dream writers. I think is what they were called, which were like kind of like if you took a typewriter and mixed it with a computer, but you couldn't do anything on it but type and print. That's what it would oh, be. Interesting. Huh. Yeah, I think that was the first attempt of my educational system to teach me to type. That one did not go well. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I got old cars. I think we saw an old taxi. Yeah. yeah. I think, like, generally speaking, um, like, with social media and all that kind of stuff, I think maybe, or even with email or whatever, like, Maxwell may have found out that his father was married before that moment, mm -hmm. if this were set today. I think you're right. And whether Maxwell saw it online or one of his siblings saw it online, he would have been told. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Uh, the intercom also made me think of, like, I just don't feel like there are as many intercoms anymore. Like, in, I don't know. I don't, I don't know it. either. But anyway. I, yeah, I, I, I see that. I remember thinking that was, like, you know, so, so technologically savvy and so fancy and now i'm just like does anyone have those anymore mm -hmm. um, lovely listeners if you have an intercom let us know mm -hmm. so yeah and then I'm i out. mean i think part of that i associate because like the house i grew up with and had an intercom <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah like it didn't really work <laughs> very well but it was there <laughs> it's kind of cool yeah. It was not a fancy one, but yeah. Anyway, uh, I think I'm out. Me too. Okay. So we can go to the kiss count. I counted four today. I did too. 
I did. So we are now up to 20. Mm -hmm. Wow. That was like a lot to add to (laughs) four in one episode. Correct. But I mean, also keep in mind, there have been plenty of episodes where they haven't kissed. So we're in season four, which means at this point, they're averaging like five kisses a season. Yeah. Yep. They have catch up to do, right? (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Now, did you count? Because, okay, because I know we have that other shtick with the after A-T-T. the thing. Yeah. Now, Fran alludes to it in this episode, but doesn't really say the thing. I'm willing to count it if you are. Okay. Because she, like, specifically is like, and then he took it back when Joan was, you know, talking about things. And she was clearly miffed at at um, Maxwell and pointing out how she likes her fa- his father better because he actually, you know, married Joan. Mm-hmm. So, like, it was, I think, very much present in this episode correct and i would even say like the most clear the clearest like allusion to it is in the the dinner scene where Mm -hmm. fran says to him you know cut your father some slack he just wants to live his life hassle-free without any commitments not unlike you let it go Mm -hmm. the man's entitled to a girlfriend like and then after that she's like that's when she says that i like him better so Mm -hmm. i think that's sufficient okay Okay, so, so we're, we're up to five. five out of six. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Um, all right, is it time for some uh, future fun? It is. All right, so the biggest not so fun thing I'll comment on is that James Sheffield actually is going to die next season. Um, and it happens in a year, the- as you predicted. <laughs> exactly. Um, and it happens shortly before Maxwell is about to remarry. Um, And James surprises everybody by leaving the bulk of his estate to his illegitimate daughter, Concepcion, who did not get to grow up and live with the privileges of being a Sheffield. Uh, Concepcion, all she ever wanted was to be welcomed into the family. And she ultimately agrees to share her newfound fortune with her siblings after Fran welcomes her to the family. Fran didn't even have to ask for her to share the money. Um, so that, that that's the most relevant piece of future fun I'll share. Is that the product of, like, his relationship with Joan? No, it is not. Ooh. It's with okay. a, um, a woman, I can't remember her name, who is a flamenco dancer. Ah, uh, okay. So, yeah. Um, she's, she's not, she's relatively comparably aged to Maxwell and his siblings. So Mm -hmm. the the daughter, not the flamenco dancer. The flamenco dancer and Sylvia have a lot in common. Okay. They they both love food and um, they, at one point they're reading like a, like a um, room service menu and they're trying to figure out what they're going to order. And they, they say, ah, that looks good. Serves four to, what is it? eight to 12 or something, four to six, some, some numbers. And then they're like, wait a minute, it says serve from, not serves. And they decide, oh, that, that wasn't what we thought. Um, mm-hmm. The show does it better than I just summarized it. So just, just you wait. <laughs> um, we, are, we do have a more Sheffield uh, mania, shall we say. Um, in two weeks, we're going to see Nigel, who's going to come to New York and surprise Maxwell. Unfortunately for, for Maxwell, um, Maxwell swapped with work and doesn't have time to show his brother around. So instead he pawns Nigel off to Fran and Nigel asks her to marry him. Mm-hmm. So wait, we'll see. We'll see what happens then. That's all I'm going to share for today. I think okay. it's time to, to rate the episode. Um, mm-hmm. Is it my, it's my turn, isn't it? Yep. It's your turn. <sighs> Okay, so I like this episode, minus the whole, like, things that don't really make a lot of sense, like forgetting that um, that his sister married the chauffeur and the family history. Um, this is, 
this is overall a good, a solid episode. I'm going to give it a 4.5 because I love, I love adding to the kiss count. I love that scene in Maxwell's office where he, where she clears off the desk and the, the raw, you know, animal lust is just delightful. How about you, Bernadette? So again, um, obviously enjoy adding to the kiss count. But again, as I mentioned, uh, detracted by like the consistent weight talk and how they deal with the whole ballet stuff. So I'm going to give it. Uh, I, I'm really waffling here. And I as know. a reminder, lovely listeners, we're always going to be free to change this, adjust it at the end. I'll just give it a four for now. Okay. Yeah, I, I know what you mean, because, like, on the one hand, I, I, I love adding to the kiss count. I, I love that, that scene in, in his office. I enjoy the parallel between Joan and Fran, and I, 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 I love the exchange about, you know, your father married his secretary, sister married her chauffeur, fell in love with her chauffeur, grandfather married made no sense breaking tradition that I can see. I love that exchange, um, but it, it's also not the best episode in the series um sorry i feel like i need to further explain my four and a half yeah and i would say there's also a difference though because like i don't know about the grandfather um but like his sister wasn't married yet when she (laughs) left with the chauffeur like he didn't like i think fran and maxwell's situation is different from his father and joan's situation because, like, his father just straight up cheated on his wife and left, his, you know, her and the children. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, that's not the situation with Fred and Maxwell. Correct. So there's not a one-to-one, like, corollary. True. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I love the, there's this, clearly this tradition in the family. Um, mm-hmm. Anyway, but... As per usual, Maxwell p- puts the brakes on things. Mm-hmm. Sigh. Yep. Is there anything else you want to talk about? I don't believe so. All right. That's all we have for you today. We hope you had a fine time with us as we revisited the nanny. Join us next week when we'll be discussing episode 82, The Taxman Cometh. If you would like to reach us on social media, you can find us on Twitter at Nanny Revisited. You can also send us email at a fine time nanny revisited at gmail.com. Have a great week.